Hello, I am currently in the Sangre de Cristo, or Blood of Christ, mountains in New Mexico. And uh, at the cabin we're staying in, there's this beautiful prayer book uh, from 17th century England uh, called The Four Birds of Noah's Ark by Thomas Decker. Decker wrote uh, prayers for each of these four birds symbolizing uh, different parts of society. Uh, there's the dove, which is the humble and peaceful bird who goes out off of Noah's Ark to try to find land, comes back and goes out again, then returns with the willow branch. So showing that the floods are receiving, it is the receding, it is the persistence of humble prayer in the dove. Uh, there's also a pelican, an eagle, and a phoenix, each of which we'll get into later. But seeing as I'm in this beautiful agricultural place, I would like to read you from the section of the Dove, the prayers for the humble folk, uh, Thomas Decker's Prayer for a Farmer. <clears throat> a Prayer for a Farmer. The earth, O oh Lord, is your garden in which you have appointed me to be a laborer. Of that stuff in which I daily dig and delve, I am made, so that in trimming the earth, I do but dress myself. Although Paul plants, although Paul plants and Apollo waters, no herb or flower can come up or tree prosper unless your hand prepares the soil. Therefore send forth a wholesome breath from your nostrils upon those fruits of the earth, that out of the bounty of your love, you have bestowed upon me, your servant. <laughs> Let not the leaf of my labor wither, but prosper until it grows up like a cedar on the heights of Lebanon, or like a tree planted by the waterside, bringing forth fruit in due season. Restrain, O oh my God, the northern wind, that it beat not down upon the farmer's hopes, but that the sickle may in due time send it to ripe and plentiful harvest. Strike not the ox at the plow with death, nor the horse in the pasture with disease, though I confess that my sins deserve to have the plagues of Egypt fall upon me and my cattle. But the wings of your mercy, O gracious God, spread farther than those of your justice. Shed, therefore, those comfortable beams upon me, a creeping worm upon the earth. And not only do I beg these worldly and fading blessings at your hand, but rather, but those rather that are heavenly and last forever. Pour your abundant grace on my soul, that it may be fruitful in good works and always bring forth seeds of holiness. Open my heart, that it may not be barren of understanding you. Clear my eyes, that they may behold the face of ignorance and loathe her and that they may look upon the beauty of your sacred wisdom and be enamored by it. For these, and whatever else you think fit for the health of my body or happiness of my soul, I most humbly beseech you in the name of your blessed Son, Jesus Christ. So in that prayer that we had just read, there are a few things that really jump out at me in terms of symbolism here. Um, one of which is the theme of perseverance. So uh, in the introduction to his book, uh, Decker mentions the dove's persistence in going out the first time Noah sends it out, and there's still water, so the dove has to come back. And the second time the dove comes out and brings an olive branch showing that the waters are receding, uh, but it still comes back because there's no land yet. And then finally the third time it goes out and does not return because it's found land to live when the uh, flood waters are receding. So uh, Decker references here actually from the second letter of St. Paul to Timothy, um, chapter 2, uh, verse 6, which references how a hard-working farmer should be the first to uh, partake in the fruits from the fields. And there's that same idea that's also echoed at other points within that chapter of perseverance. Um, and I find it very interesting how the 
dove isn't normally something we would think of as an especially resilient or perseverant bird, but this section of the prayer book, really, Decker is excellent at finding the amazing qualities in very humble people. Um, additionally, the idea that the farmer digs and delves in the earth as a way to protect them, to provide for themselves, is very interesting in this garden imagery that it opens up with. Um, it harkens back to Eden, right? Where uh, humanity are gardeners, and uh, it's from those fruits that we are to be um, to, to be eating, to provide for ourselves. And it's very interesting how a farmer, being in this state where uh, we don't just have a perfect garden where everything grows, but after the fall we need to work for it, um, finds that perseverance and praise to maintain perseverance to be able to provide for themselves. Um, it's very interesting in terms of how it works with the spiritual journey, how we go through life and need to cultivate, um, not just for some higher purpose, but also for ourselves and for others. Um, I really enjoy that reference in the beginning. There's also a symbolism of uh, let the leaf of my let not the leaf of my labor wither but prosper it till it grows up like a cedar on the heights of lebanon or like a tree planted by the waterside bringing forth fruit in due season um lebanon is famous especially in classical times for its great trees even the flag of lebanon today is a, a beautiful evergreen tree a beautiful cedar so um I find it interesting how this is in the parts of the prayer that are praying for um, for a positive, sorry, just finding my word, support in that journey. Um, knowing that the farmer is willing to put in his labor, whereas the... Um, there are still these natural conditions, these things beyond what even labor can do that um, are to have that tree grow up. Um, but I find it very beautiful, especially the hope in that the wings of mercy are greater than the wings of justice and that this grace may help us provide. Um, and as a farmer provides for himself, uh, that is also the case for others, for society as a whole. It really fits a lot of the spiritual journey in this. Um, in this poem for a very common man. So let's uh, keep going and see what else we can find. So this reading is from the second part of Decker's writing. Uh, this focuses on the eagle, which soars high and represents authority. Um, so these are the, the powerful figures um, and rulers, those who lord over others, and uh, our prayers that discuss the role that someone outside the common folk would play. So this is a prayer for the king. Kings are like gods upon the earth, yet, O Lord, they are but your servants. They rule kingdoms, yet the chariot of their empire turns over and over, unless you teach them how to hold the bridle. Among men they are more than men, yet they are less than themselves if they break your laws. Since they are your stewards and are trusted with much, it is a great reckoning to which they must answer. Lay therefore, O God, your right hand upon the head of our sovereign, King James. Fasten his crown to his temples, that no treason may lift it off. Bind it about with olive branches, and let peace ever dwell in the circle of it. Plant a guard of angels around his bed and a troop of saints around his throne so that his sleep may be golden slumbers and his waking be divine meditations. Pour into his bosom your grace so that all his actions may advance your glory. Be his armor in the day of battle and like the wings of an eagle, let your arms cover him in the sunshine of peace. Make him, O Lord, a priest in your church, a shepherd in your flocks, a father in your commonwealth, a captain in your combats, a conqueror in your wars. Crown his middle age with a great number of years as you have crowned his youth with the inheritance of many kingdoms. 
Let the dial of his life move slowly on, and do not let the last hour of his old age strike, until those who now stand up around him like the tender branches of the vine may be seen growing on the banks of his kingdom, like so many rows of tall cedars. Let his reign, O Lord, be like the age of Methuselah, his knowledge like the wisdom of Solomon, and his offspring blessed like the seed of Abraham. Give him David's soul, but do not let him fall into David's sins. Let him number his people, do not, not to make you angry with him, but to make him love them. Tie, O God, all the strings of their hearts to his bosom, like so many lines drawn to one center. So shall their safety be his fortress, their prosperity his riches, and the hours of his pleasure the sweetest of their contentment. Grant these and all other blessings fit for such a prince. Grant them, O Lord, for the benefit of your church, for the honor of this kingdom, and for the peace of your people. Amen. I find this, uh, again, to be a very powerful prayer in that it doesn't focus on uh, the glories of a king, but the responsibilities. Um, and there's a very fine line to be walked on that, um, to be a servant leader, a servant king. Um, there is the idea of the chariot turning over and over unless the king is being taught. It, it really reminds me a lot of uh, the Chinese concept of the mandate of heaven, right? Where, um, where the king, the ruler, um, will rule as long as they're in accordance with higher principles. Um, where this poem goes even beyond that is connecting the king to the common people. I really um, like the image of letting him number his people, not to not to upset God, as though having the census trying to, uh, which classically being a very difficult thing to do, numbering the people, having a census. It's like trying to have a, a record of everything, trying to have everything under its control. And in Decker's prayer, it's not to let the king number the people so that he may... Uh, know where all of they, them are, but so that he may listen to them and uh, know the people that he serves. It is a very high ideal for kingship, um, and I think is beautiful of everything that the eagle symbolizes in the four birds. Let's move on to the next one, the pelican. The next of Decker's four birds is the pelican, um, which may not be one that comes to mind to us when you were to think of naming birds, especially majestic symbolic ones. Um, but this comes to a medieval uh, belief surrounding the pelican that it would, um, it was believed to feed its young with its own blood, uh, that it would peck at itself to get some blood to nourish its young. Um, and while that may not be um, biologically the case as we know now, um, that symbolism is what's here, self-sacrifice. Um, Decker was known as a uh, little bit of a wild party boy in London of his time, um, but it was said that um, for anyone who questioned his devotion to his faith, um, it was said that while he may not have been the best at uh, living a holy life, he was among the absolute best at prayers for forgiveness. Uh, this is one of them named a prayer for the morning. It is a beautiful, um, it is a beautiful prayer, um, starting with rebirth at the rise of a new day that I think you'll enjoy. A prayer for the morning. When I rise from my bed, O oh my redeemer, it puts me in mind of my rising from the grave when the last trumpet shall sound and summon us to the general resurrection. Then I hope to behold you coming in the fullness of your glory, and your Father sitting in the brightness of his majesty, and that I shall have a place among those who are written in your book of life. So, O oh my mediator, make intercession for me, so that all the sins of my former days and nights being freely pardoned, I may this day be welcomed into your service. Receive, therefore, O Lord, this early sacrifice, both of my soul and my body. 
I offer them up into your hands to be disposed of at your pleasure, and with them I offer unfeigned sighs for having offended you, and with those sighs my zealous prayers for your pardon, and with those prayers and assured hope that in your mercy and in the blood of that loving pelican, Jesus Christ, who died for me, I shall be forgiven. Blessed be your name for blessing me this night from danger. I read in the book, written by your own finger, that you cast Adam into sleep when you made a woman from his rib. By this I note that man of himself has no power to bind slumber to his temples unless you give it to him. All thanks, therefore, be yours, that this night has covered me with the soft wings of quietness, and so graciously does now allow me to behold the light of the day. Go on, O God, with your favors toward me, your humble servant. Go along beside me and with me all this day and all the days of my life, so that I may not step into the path of sin. Grant this, I beseech you. Give me your grace and forgive me my debts, which I owe to sin and death. So be it. Amen. So in the Pelican, um, in the Pelican section, Decker has each poem corresponding to a deadly sin, and I really um, find beauty in the hope that Decker finds in overcoming them through, um, of course, in his Christian understanding, uh, the sacrifice of Christ. It is very beautiful work, granting the importance to a new day, thankfulness for it, for a sleep, and seeing that moment of uh, each day, each beginning as a little rebirth. I find that very beautiful and uh, found that poem very much worth sharing. Now let's hear one more from the section, The Phoenix. So the final poem uh, in, these, in the Four Birds of Noah's Ark uh, is actually uh, the last poem of the Phoenix section, titled A Thanksgiving for All Those Benefits We Are to Receive by Christ's Coming in Glory. So the Phoenix, uh, probably one of the most beautiful, uh, popular, symbolic, mythological creatures, um, was believed to live a long life, longer than any other bird, and when it knew of its time to die, would gather up spices and beautiful things in a high place, look at the sun and beating its wings to bring the sun's heat to light them all up, and there would be a beautiful fire from which the phoenix would burn itself, but of course the ashes that would remain would rise and give birth to a new one. So the phoenix here is resurrection, which of course Decker as a Christian finds uh, paralleled in the resurrection of Christ. So this last poem, uh, Christ Coming in Glory, references the book of Revelation, the ending of the Bible, uh, quite a bit of which is directly, almost word for word, um, taken here and really summarizes um, his hope for everything. Decker was living in London during a time of plague, a uh, time of persecution, a uh, very challenging time. And I think that the Phoenix, the resurrection here, really shows the hope that Decker feels. So I'll go ahead and read this last poem now. A thanksgiving for all those benefits we are to receive by Christ's coming in glory. Behold, the gates of heaven stand wide open. Armies of angels are mustered together. The apostles keep their places, the evangelists their offices, the saints their degrees, and all are attendant upon our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus, who sits upon a throne of majesty and is coming to judge the world. At the sight of this, the wicked tremble and call for mountains to cover them, but the godly rejoice and are proud of this high day of triumph. The goats howl, for they are to be sent to hell. Go, you cursed! But the lambs skip for joy, that they shall hear a voice cry, Come, you blessed! Who, therefore, would not put on his wedding garment to meet such a bridegroom? Who would not put on the armor of faith to fight under such a banner? Upon this day shall we behold him who is in self, is Alpha and Omega, in the world 
is the maker and the maintainer. In his angels is their power and their beauty. In the church is a father to a family. In our souls as a bridegroom to a bride. To the just as a bulwark. To the reprobate as a battering ram. What eye has seen, what ear has heard, what understanding can comprehend the excellence of this heavenly city? From there the king of that city, so full of majesty, comes in person and in progression to conduct us there. There is security without fear, peace without invasion, wealth without diminishment, honors without envy. There is all blessedness, all sweetness, all life, all eternity. There your hunger shall be filled with the bread of life, your thirst quenched with the fountain of goodness, your nakedness clothed with a garment of immortality. The comforts we shall receive upon this blessed day of peace are that we shall see and behold our God who has created us, our Lord Jesus who has redeemed us, and the Holy Ghost who has sanctified us. Come therefore speedily, O God, for your elect's sake, hasten to this great and general session. And grant, O merciful Father, that our accounts may be found so just that we may receive the rewards of good stewards. Make us, O Lord, to be doves in our lives, innocent and without gall, to be eagles in our meditations, clear-sighted and bold to look upon you, to be pelicans in our works, charitable and religious, and lastly, to be as the phoenix in our death that after we have slept in our graves, we may rise up in joy with your Son and ascend with him into heaven, and there at your gates receive an immortal crown of everlasting glory. Amen. And uh, those are just some of the selections from The Four Birds of Noah's Ark by Thomas Decker. Hopefully you enjoyed <laughs>